Welcome to my talk. My name is Tobias Rittig and I will be giving today's presentation on behalf of my shared first author, Dennis Sumin, and our other co-authors from these six institutions. These are Charles University Prague, MPI Saarbrücken, Uzi Lugano, Keldish Institute of Applied Mathematics Moscow, IST Austria and UCL London. As you can see, our title consists of two parts. And I will first introduce you to the second part. What is scattering aware color 3D printing? The most detailed color 3D printers out there use inkjet 3D printing or material jetting to deposit tiny droplets of liquid photoactivated polymer on top of each other. The droplets are immediately hardened by UV light so that the next layer can be printed on top of it. These machines produce great fidelity and are used in multiple industries where appearance matters, such as prototyping, visual effects, or medical prosthetics. The intrinsic problematic of the technology is the translucency of the materials. It is required for mixing of colors, but it also leads to texture blur and unwanted color gamut limitations. Look here on the right side, where a naive solution that just extrudes surface color, loses all the fine details and has a lower overall contrast. We addressed these problems in two previous publications by our group. Scattering aware texture reproduction for 3D printing pioneered this problematic and solved it for planar 2.5D geometry. The follow-up work, Geometry Aware Scattering Compensation for 3D Printing, extended this work to 3D and solved color crosstalk um, around thin geometry. Both methods use an iterative optimization loop that continuously predicts the appearance and refines the material arrangement to get a better match to the virtual target. For the prediction step, we used Monte Carlo light transport simulation, which was accurate, but unfortunately very expensive to compute. In this work, we address this prediction step and present the method based on machine learning to replace a costly light transport simulation, but while maintaining its high quality. So you can get 3D printouts like these, but up to two orders of magnitude faster per iteration and with considerably reduced hardware requirements. Our contributions along the topic consist of a fast predictor for fully heterogeneous subsurface scattering, vital architecture improvements over a previous technique that we learned from crowd rendering, a synthetic data set for volume, and various engineering solutions for memory efficient and out of court training. Let me first specify how we model the 3D printouts in our pipeline. A path tracing simulation starts from the surface and traces rays into the medium in the direction of the normal. There, the rays scatter many, many times until they reach the surface again at a different location. This represents the light attenuation underneath the surface for a diffuse and constant illumination over the surface. The interior of objects is filled with a heterogeneous, participating medium that has not only sparing bearing albedo, but also the optical density changes for every walk. The medium consists of the com like the medium is a composite of the five basic materials that the printer can produce, which are cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and white. There's also a transparent material, but we do not consider it in this work. In essence, we propose to replace this expensive recursive simulation with a machine learned model that gives the same result per surface point for a single interest. Okay, now let's look at related work. Deep learning has been applied to volume rendering before. In this work, Vitini et al. propose a model that can predict the exit location and the transmittance for an incoming ray that enters a homogeneous medium. The second work by Calvert et al. Propose predicts the multiple scattering contribution of media with heterogeneous density for very directional lighting. Both of these integrate the neural network into a ray-based simulation, whereas we created the network for the final result without the, the need for any rays. As the top work is limited to homogeneous media only, we base our approach on the bottom one and extend it to also work with spatially varying albedo. So let me explain this work in more detail so you understand how these radians predicting neural networks are used. So once a ray hits the cloud, the first scattering event is sampled. 
From there, a single scattering ray is connected to the sun, and any multiple scattering is predicted by the network itself. For that, a descriptor of the local medium configuration, also called a stencil, is sampled around that point on multiple stages. The authors implicitly encode the light direction to the network by rotating the stencil towards the sun. The stencil is hierarchical, which means that it consists of multiple levels with the same resolution, but different coverage and accuracy of the surrounding volume. Here, two levels are displayed, which double in size. And typically, you would extract 10 levels to cover enough distance around the center point for the light transport to be negligible. The network itself is a fairly simple feedforward multilayer perceptron with skip connection. Inside, each block receives one level of the hierarchical stencil as input. The signal is collected from all the scales in the RPN n blocks and then mixed with three dense layers to produce a single throughput value at the output. This process is repeated for every ray, millions of which are necessary for a converged image of a cloud. And I will now talk about our contributions to RPN ends and how we use them differently for 3D printing volumes. In our setting, instead of shooting rays, we predict the final appearance of the surface completely with the network. So for each surface voxel, we extract a stencil that describes the surrounding volume. Then we run them in parallel batches through the network, which yields a single radiance value in the end. We reassemble these values into a 3D grid again to map the appearance back to the surface voxel. This loop is independent for different color channels, but they all use the same network. Our prediction pipeline is pretty much the same during inference and training, except that the stencils during training are not only from a single vo volume, but from many training examples. The data set we use for training is purely synthetic. We generate it from these six basic shapes, a cube, a sphere, and a thin plane with some rotation. We instantiate them in a few different sizes from five to 25 millimeters, and fill the inside with a procedural volumetric texture that is generated by a noise function. You can see a few examples on the right side here, together with a slice through to give you an intuition of the inner color distribution. The ground truth appearance through these volumes is obtained via Monte Carlo simulation with 512 samples. Before rendering, the volumes are half toned to the five discrete printer materials that have a specific measured scattering and absorption coefficient differing over R, G, and B, as we plot here on the bottom left. The space is convertible from the albedo density parameterization that I was talking about before, but has the benefit of being linear so that the network can interpolate better. Let me stress how sparse this dataset really is in terms of geometric variation and the volumetric properties of the material. The limiting factor here is memory, especially during training. Already this dataset does not fit into 256 gigabytes of memory and it has to be streamed during the training process. In order to describe the volume topology to the network, we take a similar approach to Calvite it out. And we sample the volume around the surface voxel. Instead of an elongated stencil, we sample a symmetric cube that is aligned with our voxel grid and extract scattering and absorption coefficients per sample point. The stencil consists of nine hierarchical levels that double in footprint, but keep the same resolution. This means that on the lowest level, we directly sample our neighboring voxel. And on the next level, we average two voxels together and treat them as one sample point. This continues until we can describe enough of the surrounding light transport so that the influence becomes negligible. Technically, we solve this averaging using three-dimensional summed area tables or integral volumes that we implemented in a two-level hierarchical way in order to support sparsity and also circumvent numerical accuracy problems. That saves precious memory during training. We also improved the rather generic network architecture itself to make it more suitable for volume rendering. We introduce weight sharing in two places for two distinct purposes. First, we share weights between blocks because each of them essentially processes the same neighborhood but on a different scale. This effectively is the same as looking at the volume from further away and is also the same as increasing the optical density. 
that is a physical invariant that is intrinsic to optic uh, to intrinsic to volumetric light transport and we make sure make use of them so we can share the network weights between the blocks but we have to adjust the optical density of the input values to bring them on the same reference plane on the graph of the values, this effectively scales the convex hulls to bigger and bigger levels if, to cover more of the parameter domain for each level. I will repeat this animation again. Note that there's also more values appearing in between, and this stems from the averaging during the stencil creation. Where more and more diverse ratios between the base materials are possible, the bigger the average volume is. Second, we also make use of diffuse lighting that we have in our setup. Under such lighting, the object looks the same no matter how you rotate it against the coordinate system. In order to model such rotational invariance, you would ideally use a network that has a spherical coordinate system. Um, but we have come up with a simple solution where you can keep the simplicity of a grid-based network and approximate this rotational symmetry. For that, we split our data, the, our input data, in two halves for each axis and rotate these partial cubes or octants to a common orientation. Then we process them with the same weights. This creates a weak rotational symmetry between the coordinate axis and the data's orientation. In the network, this concept is applied throughout the whole graph. Inside of each block, which I haven't detailed any further in this talk, and also for the dense gathering layers in the end. Both of our weight sharing schemes are useful for general volume rendering. Excuse me, general volume rendering. But the second one is more specific to the diffuse illumination that we have in our setup. At the end of the processing, we receive a single value which represents the total radiance due to subsurface scattering in one color channel. Okay, now let's look at some results. In the following, we are comparing our network against the ground truth Monte Carlo simulation with 512 samples and a baseline architecture, which does not include our weight sharing improvements. We report timings for these hardware configurations where the neural networks run on a conventional desktop workstation and the Monte Carlo method requires a whole compute cluster. The objects we compare have a more realistic volume distribution of, of the materials compared to our generated training data set. And the different images I will be showing use a perceptual color metric where darker is better. For a single forward prediction of an existing volume, the quality between Monte Carlo and ours is on the same level for most parts of the geometry. The baseline architecture without weight sharing clearly suffers from, more, from the more sparse dataset and produces banding artifacts. The computational effort for this 4 cm object decreased dramatically to about 2 minutes, even on a single machine. Now let's look at the neural protector inside an iterative optimization loop. Here, any potential bias would add up over multiple iterations and manifest itself in the final appearance. Again, the quality between ours and Monte Carlo matches very well. If we look at the difference images against the target, our network even produces a slightly better match in some areas. For the baseline network, the blacks are underestimated resulting in an over-darkening of the optimization. When we compare against the Monte Carlo solution, which uses the same runtime as ours, you can even visually see the reduced quality in the details. We see a similar trend when we look at fabricated results. The two samples are hard to tell apart in terms of quality, but the neural network driven optimization pipeline ran in only 30 minutes overall. For the network, the runtime is independent of the geometric complexity and the optical density, which allows a scattering aware 3D printing pipeline to become practical for the first time. If you want to see more printer results as well as a study um, between differentiable rendering versus our heuristic optimization, um, I would 
invite you to look at our paper and the supplemental material. Okay, so far we've established that the network does what it is intended for. Now to a more detailed evaluation of our performance. Say in the future we have a new material set with uh, different optical properties. Here's two examples where we make the object four times more opaque and four times more translucent. And indeed, our network is still able to predict the appearance well, thanks to our weight sharing over hierarchical levels. And that is absent in the baseline architecture, causing the failure here. Note that this is just a constant shift over the density axis, but what if we throw some more complex materials at it? And we show that by inventing a completely new material set with a smooth spectral distribution that re roughly resembles a CMYKW material set. You can see the, the smooth parameters varying here on the bottom left. And because we trained only a single channel network, it's straightforward to apply the network to multiple spectral bands and get a spectral prediction. The results we observed show the same trend as before. Our neural network is still closely matches the Monte Carlo simulation because the values here are still within the range of the training values. The baseline solution doesn't fail in this example. Overall, we think that this network will be very useful in the future and possibly even for other applications outside of 3D printing. Of course, our method also has its limitations. We have two weak assumptions, one being the diffuse illumination although one could mo model a more directional lighting similar to carbide R. And secondly, our render data set assumes a voxel to be a perfect sharp cube um, with sharp boundaries. And this might not be entirely realistic because of materials mixing during the print process, but one could re-render the data set with some interpolations to simulate that. A more strict limitation we encountered is that the stencil representation is somewhat ambiguous for geometry that has holes inside. It expresses itself as training instability and we see it as future work to solve this problem. In conclusion, I've shown you a machine learned predictor for the appearance of fully heterogeneous media. I told you how we apply weight sharing in order to generalize better, especially with a very limited data set. For those of you who want to play with the network yourself, we publish our dataset and the code under this link. And finally, I want to take this opportunity to thank Sebastian Kuzerka and the following grant agencies for supporting this project. My special thank you belongs to Jaroslav Kshivanek, who always knew an answer and never gave up. He is deeply missed. Thank you for your attention.